Ruben Rivera. Uh, I'm in the Department of History at Bethel, and I've been here. This is my 13th year. Um, well, I'll be finishing my 13th year in May, and uh, I'm mostly church, uh, a, a historian of Christianity by trade, but I've been particularly interested in how Christianity has worked itself out in places most people don't know much about, particularly Latin America. So I, you know, anything related to Christianity. So I, the, the, you know, Christianity in America, Christianity in Latin America, Christianity in Western culture, you know, stuff like that. And I do a multicultural history of the U.S. Uh, when I think of culturally responsive instruction, I, I, you know, I think culturally responsive or culturally inclusive. Um, I think of a bunch of things. Some things that it's not. Some things that it is. For example, I don't. I, I think that some people sometimes look down on that. I don't think that it is that it's just like meaningless relativism. For example, it isn't just um, you know an attempt to see all kind of cultural value systems as of equal value and worth. Um, it is an attempt, I don't think it is a dumbing down, you know, that uh, sometimes uh, some folks think it's, well, you know, you're leaving, you know, these, the, you know, the really intellectual good stuff for emotional, affective kinds of things. Um, I think part of it is, for me, it's, it's, what it is, is an attempt as a historian, so I need to, I need, I'm going to talk about this stuff as I see it as a historian, as a Christian, and as a Latino, because I know that I bring all kinds of things into this educational enterprise. So as a historian, it's an attempt to account for the, the multicultural reality of the world. Um, it's, it was funny because for a while you used to have to defend that somehow as if you were doing something unusual, saying, no, I mean, this, this is the historical enterprise. You're attempting to account for something that is far more complete. You're attempting to add more chapters to the book. Um, so something that's accountable to the multicultural reality. Um, I think for me it's also an attempt to to understand, you know, kind of the characteristics, the challenges, the contributions of different of different cultures, and not just kind of the American merit meta narrative. Another thing for me is that um, you probably heard of the, the Spanish political philosopher Jose Ortega, Ortega Ortega y Gasset, who once said that um, in in history and in politics, if one takes accepted statements at face value, one will be sadly misled. So part of this for me is is to shake up the official story. It's to try to is to try to understand things beyond the official story, and um, you know to kind of test you know um, the meta narrative a bit. Um, you know I guess I guess at its root it's just simply a way to try to get, uh, uh, particularly in America, which is becoming increasingly diverse. The 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 the, the public school classroom in America is becoming, as from what I'm reading. A predominantly people of color, you know, and ethnic minorities. So it's a way of including their story in a way that they can uh, not just know about it, but they can contribute to it. You know, how, how do they understand themselves? It's a way of maybe us seeing each other, uh, not just analyzing it as an outsider or looking at it or trying to understand it as an outsider, but, but seeing it from an insider's perspective seeing cultures and experiences, values, uh, you know, th that are different from your own, but with a human face. And the only way to do that is to, is to include those voices, and not just the data, but it has, to, it has to include those different voices in such a way that they're human, not just this information that we can look at and critique from our perspectives. Uh, the other thing is, for me, from, from a Christian perspective, when I when I think of Christianity, for example, um, the way I understand the way I understand what 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 scholars call or, or Christians call salvation history, it was always meant to be transnational. It was multicultural in its scope from the very beginning. Whether you're looking at the promises in Genesis all the way to the re re reiterations in the New Testament. Um, you know, the, the promise, the, the covenant with Abraham, you know, it's supposed to be, you know, a blessing to all the world. Well, by the time you get to Jesus, there's all the cultural captivity, you know, so that Jesus is having to deal with the cultural captivity of the covenant in many different ways. And, uh, of course, Christianity then emerges, and Christians have basically been doing the same thing. So one, one of the things that is really important for me is culturally responsive education accounts for the global scope of, for example, of history, the global scope of salvation history in particular, if we're a Christian institution. Um, 
and hopefully in a way that, that helps us avoid you know, the cultural captivity of history, the cultural captivity of Christianity in particular in a school like this. You know, it's not to sh shake up the history just for the sake of shaking it up, but for one, there's been so many chapters of that history that have been missing. For someone like myself who grew up invisible in a public school curriculum, I get to finally see someone like myself, my culture, my values, reflected in that story. Um, and the other thing I think is really important is that, um, you know, as, as America is becoming a place that is, in fact, much increasingly diverse, that it is accounting for the diversity of the people who are sitting in the chairs. Um, when I went to school, there was no one that looked like me, the, the, none, no one in politics looked like me, no one on television looked like me, um, and yet there we were, you know, uh, you know there, were, there were several, many students who looked like me, but nothing about the school and the curriculum had anything to do with us and our values and what, what our world was, our, our troubles and you know, what we could be when we grew up. So if anything else, a culturally responsive uh, instruction needs to account for the people who are sitting in front of you, and which, in, which increasingly in our day is going to be more and more diverse, uh, even here in, in the Twin Cities, from what I understand. Um, you know, Bethel needs to be a place that is going to have to account for that. Um, the other thing, too, is uh, I'm hoping that why it's important is it helps us to see each other beyond just stereotypes. Um, beyond just stuff that we've been told or, you know, what, what pol you know, politicians as they debate each other or, you know, as we're on one side of an issue or another. Um, so it's very hard to look at anything objectively. If, if mo many Americans, when they think of immigration, they think of illegal immigration. Many Americans, particularly post 9-11, when they think of Middle Easterners or Muslims, they think of terrorism, extreme Islam. So if anything, you know, a, a, a culturally inclusive or responsive in, uh, education begins to help us to see that these are humans. If nothing else, they're humans. And, um, and that, you know, m maybe we can get to a point where we can at least start figuring out that um, we're not always the heroes in the story, um, that, um, that there are many contributions, you know, religious contributions, I don't know, artistic, whatever that come from places and people other than just myself. So for me, you know, one of the main things I try to do is just to, is to get students to see that these are humans we're talking about, even though they're different from you. I can talk about two different things. One is the absence of it, which I, which I believe has been extremely harmful. So um, I know growing up, as I've said, you know, I was invisible in the, in the curriculum, in the public school curriculum. And there were a lot of things, so, so essentially it meant there was a tremendous amount of pressure for me to commit some level of cultural suicide and just to fit in. Um, at Bread, even, even though I felt like I was a fairly intelligent guy, uh, school was a place that was, I didn't feel comfortable in at all. So I checked out or literally ditched school altogether. Um, it also made me feel like, uh, you know, I felt because my mind was always thinking about all this other stuff that I couldn't perform well in school. Yet when I got out of that and I grew up and I started going to, and I, and I was involved in places or in schools where, where, cult, where there was more cultural sensitivity, um, I excelled. I, I did very, very well in school. And I, you know, I graduated my bachelor's degree summa cum laude. You know, that was like miles away from where I was at when I was in public school. So there is, there's a lot of harm when this isn't done because most of the stories that I would get were, you know, where the people look like me, who look like me uh, you know, in, in readings or in television were the folks who were killing the peaceful settlers as they were crossing the plains. So it's very damaging in terms psychologically and so on, and it really affects classroom performance and education. I, can, I know that personally. Um, I've seen uh, people who are sincere and try to do culturally inclusive stuff in the classroom, um, but it's, you know, how could I put this? There's a lot of sincerity, but not a lot of experience. Um, so a lot of it is maybe kind of too book learning. Um, it, it, it doesn't really allow for, for students to really, you know, uh, sh uh, share their thoughts. It doesn't allow for the kind of exploration and activity that maybe, you know, that kind of goes beyond the page. Um, 
And the other thing is, is, is a little, it's a little too much sit still while I instill. Uh, a little too much of a lecture format that doesn't allow the students uh, to, it doesn't provide a safe atmosphere for the students, particularly students of color in the classroom, to share what they think. Um, I've seen it done badly even by people of color. Sometimes I've seen some of this done in the classroom by people of color where it's almost now that they're in a position of power and authority, they use it as an opportunity to get back. I've, I've, I've heard snide remarks, jokes, um, and, and things that are said that actually alienate uh, particularly white people in the audience. Uh, so that I, I don't find a particularly helpful way of doing this. Um, but I would say that um, among the most helpful, among the most unhelpful ways of doing this is um, is simply kind of reading and lecture format and not really allowing the students to have the responsibility to kind of kind of do some of this on their own and come to the class and tell us, tell the teacher, tell the rest of their colleagues um, how they understand, you know, how their understanding is on, on, on a, whether we're talking about another culture or a theme or a, a controversial issue. I would say that experiential learning tends, you know, people who do that do very well where they provide activities. Um, in other words, if you just told someone that, um, you know, that uh, there's a, such a thing as white privilege, you know, that's not going to really get people, you know, uh, particularly the white students in the classroom. But if you have an activity, or if you, pri if you provide, like, you know, I do a lot of Socratic scenarios in the classroom where you get students to commit to something first, and then once they've done that, then you kind of take them to something else, and then you test. They're able to test, the students are able to test whether they're accurate historically or, you know, or just factually accurate as well as um, is their thinking consistent or is, is there dishonesty you know, or bias in their thinking. So when it comes to those, those things, I actually never lecture. Um, and I've seen some really outstanding things done you know, uh, when, when you're dealing with issues like that where you, you kind of put the ball in the student's court and you, and you give them opportunity First of all, they, they have to discover what it is they think or know about something or someone or some group. They come and inform. Uh, and, then, and then you take them to kind of another step. I've seen that work extremely well. I can give you, I can give you examples of, of certain things I've seen done or certain things I've done. But I, I think um, in, inclusive responsiveness means there's opportunity to respond. Um, and at some point in the game, the teacher has to step back and, and not do so much sit still while I instill stuff. I, I try to make sure, first of all, that the curriculum is inclusive. Um, I mean, you can't have inclusiveness unless the curriculum itself, the content is inclusive. I also try to, from the very beginning, try to create an atmosphere where it's, it's, it's comfortable to talk about uncomfortable issues. Um, I literally lay out ground rules in terms of, you know, um, students taking responsibility for what they say to, to say me, I think, rather than they, to own your own statements. Um, um, you know, so you, 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 you kind of lay certain ground rules. You literally state, you know, things about respect and we're going to be dealing with controversial issues. Um, then, of course, as a teacher, you try to model these things. And um, one of the ways I do that, if we're dealing with a controversial issue, is to is, is first of all I don't tell them what I think about that I don't instruct them in that they're supposed to research and find that stuff for themselves and I'll let them you know I mean there there are some readings or films that I have but but ultimately I say you can use any resource you want to to come to what you think about something and what you what you end up you know what side of an issue you end up on um, I also try to make sure that that um, that you know, if someone says something in class, that that responses are respectful, even though even though there are many 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 differences. So as a teacher, I have to intervene because sometimes there'll be a response from from somebody to something that can go in a negative direction or or can get personal. And as a teacher, you have to do that. Um, it's important to know the students. Um, so you know, just as, after all, students care if you know them. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a, someone who uses a lot of energy when I teach, so I have to be careful that I don't, in my tone or what it is I'm doing, that I, con that I convey that I'm biased already on a particular issue that we're talking about. 
Um, and again, I, I try as best I can to let them do most of the talking. I give them, as it, as it is, by, by example, permission to disagree. For example, if we're going to talk about, in a classroom like, like minorities in America, where m most of the students in there will disagree with affirmative action, what they feel is for people of color. Um, I, you know, I, I, I want people to say what they actually think. And again, they do the research on that. They come to class and tell me what it is, where it came from, why it emerged, what it intended to do, and where they are on that issue. Uh, I never tell them anything, what I think about it. They, they instruct us, and then they talk about it in class. But I will let them know. That, so that they're so that you know so that they feel safe that they can talk or disagree. Is it, you know, I, I just say you know just to let you know from the very beginning there are some things I don't like about it either. You know, and so I, I try to I, I try to give them permission to disagree or to say something, for you know so that there are some students who want to say what they think but they are afraid of that if they do, they'll be they'll be pigeonholed as racist or something like that. Then again, you know, for students of color. Oftentimes they're afraid to speak because if they do, then they're known, you know, as someone with a chip on their shoulder or something like that. So it's a real balancing act. Now, I've been told, and I've been interviewed even by students who have asked me on more than one occasion, you know, you deal with really controversial issues. How do you do that in the classroom and not alienate the students? And I say, well, I th as I said, the first thing I try to do is, is I don't, I try not to give them any opportunity to say, well, that's Professor Rivera's opinion. He's just trying to voice his opinion on us. They can't say that because I haven't told them what I think about it. Um, and I try to make them responsible to articulate what they think about something and then create a, create a, a dialogue in the classroom so that people can honestly... And another way you can do that is, for example, if you're dealing with a controversial issue, is you don't divide them up between, say, people of color and whites. You just divide it up between kind of the two major sides, and it doesn't matter. And so there might be there might be people of color and white people on either side of that particular issue or debate. And that way, it doesn't it doesn't get polarized along you know kind of racial lines or gender lines or anything like that. Um, or I'll have them do an assignment where the, where they have to take the opposing position. That you know whatever that is, you know, so they already have an idea of what their position and opinion is on a particular thing. I say, well, your job is to take the, to, is to present the best argument possible for the opposing side. That has worked. One, I've had students tell me I had never thought about it this way until then. And I realize now that the other side has some really good arguments or something like that. So, um, and I, and you have to intervene. I intervene a lot. I try as best I can by, by modeling that it's okay to talk and uh, that this might be the safest place some of us will ever have to do this again. Um, and from what I've been getting, that's, I, you know, when I first started teaching, I, I, I think I had, you know, some student assessments that would say, you know, well, you can't really say what you think in a classroom like this. But, but it's been years, I think, since I've heard anything like that. What you're about to see is the first class session of the course I teach in interim. It's called Christianity in America. And the first day, uh, the, the session that you'll see, all I'm trying to do is stimulate interest. So the questions I asked are designed not to, I'm not looking for correct answers or anything like that. I'm trying to challenge them to think, you know, what, you know, what do you think about when you think of Mormons? What do you, you know, as a Christian, you know, how do you... How do you deal with topics? So that's all that was designed to do because the next thing I get into is historiography and we try to look at, you know, how has uh, the, the, Christi the history of Christianity typically been done, what's been left out and why. What thoughts immediately come to mind when confronted with a religion different from your own? Kind of the first thing that comes into your head, okay, it might be a word, might be a feeling, okay? When confronted with a religion different from yours, okay, got it? Okay. Uh, anybody, just just say what say what you think. What do they believe and why? Okay. Uh, just I want feelings. Do you mean like common beliefs? I'm sorry. Do you mean common beliefs? Okay. Good. Yes. How is their worldview affected by their religion? And 
Okay, someone over here, yes. I'm always curious to like, know what their practices are or like, their history sort of. Yes. Well, I guess, like, not in a mean way, but I kind of, like, you're wrong, kind of, comes <laughs> to my head. Yeah, thank you. I, that's what I want. I want honesty. I, I need you to say what you actually think. It does you no good to, to be afraid to say what you actually think because, you know, you might appear maybe intolerant or, uh, you know, you want to appear politically correct or whatever the case might be, but this is what you actually think. And so it's important to, 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 to say that, to try to be honest. Yes. Like, uh, how can we avoid like, the religious stereotypes like when interacting with people of different religions? <coughs> Why? Well, I mean, why do you say this? Well, like, I, I feel like when you're like interacting with someone of like a different religion, like, you, there's a lot of stereotypes out there, and you, you kind of want to show them that like it's not all true. That you know. Like, What's the danger of just seeing other faiths in stereotypes? Yes. Well, if you just want to learn more, go on the stereotype thing. We just want to learn more, more about their culture. Yeah. But st you still think yours is right. Like, yeah. It's fascinating. Yep. I mean, if, if, if you just know someone else and their faith in stereotypes, what, what problems arise? They're going to be quick to judge. Yeah, you judge them, and you judge them based on stuff that might not be so accurate. I mean, do you ever feel sometimes as a Christian that, 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 that today in America that you're being judged or being stereotyped or put in a box that you do not like? How does that feel? Say, like, no, you don't know me. You know, I'm 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 not you know you know like uh, if you if you've ever, if you've seen um, uh, the recent documentary by Bill Maher, Religious. Anyone seen this? I might show you some clips of it. And you look at it and just say, that's not me. Or or you know someone else is kind of exploring and they're kind of they're not evangelical, but they're kind of exploring America's uh, evangelical subculture and they're going inside. And then the stuff you see on the screen is just like. Man, but that's just a tiny clip, you know, you don't understand who I am. You don't understand if you see me with my hands raised or see me crying, you know, you make it look like it's dumb or it's a mockery or something, you know. And so, you know, when you feel that way, imagine how other folks feel from different faiths. Because you don't really know them either. <coughs> okay. Okay, let me ask another question. What do you think is the greatest challenge of the fact of increasing diversity you know, uh, religious diversity. I mean, I'm talking about diversity in general. Chris. Uh, I think a big challenge is just, you know, encouraging everyone to be accepting of all different areas. Of, you know, like not necessarily like bringing everybody's beliefs into your own life, but be accepting of them. You know, in different ways, I guess. Uh, this is really huge, really huge. Okay, we're going to talk about this later when we talk about you know, uh, you know, uh, mission and evangelism in the church, what that's all about. We're going to ask some very basic and fundamental questions. What is the nature and the purpose of biblical revelation? I mean, what is the gospel, exactly? I mean, are there central elements, you know, that, like, you know, that these are the non-negotiables. And then, quite frankly, there's a lot of stuff that is just kind of culturally, you know, they're, they're kind of cultural expressions, and they're not necessary for salvation, for example. You know, maybe one of the, one of the only absolutes left is tolerance, you know, but, but tolerance is not always, tolerance is in God, I mean, to tolerate each other doesn't necessarily mean you're going to actually like each other, um, or maybe inside you're the same, you know, I mean, you've heard the statement, right, you know, you're supposed to hate the sin but love the sinner, okay, we're going to talk about that, <laughs> uh, I think a lot of times people hate the sinner too. Um, but you know, it, it, it kind of goes with that that assumption that you know, look, I'm not I'm not saying you know I mean all sin and fall short of the glory of God. I get that, but I need to say something about this because I just think it's wrong. Can you do that? Are you free to do that? Or are we being pressured not to do that? What's the greatest opportunity? Let's just uh, <coughs> let's quickly say a few of these. Plurality. Okay, and the diversity is increasing. There's no way to stop it. It's always been here, but it's increasing. So, uh, you know, this might, th some of these might fall under the category of problem or challenge. What are the opportunities? Understanding. Okay, <clears throat> understanding. I don't have any place to write that. Because, like, I mean, when we understand, like, other religions and what they go through, it kind of strengthens our own faith in a way. Yeah. Because we, we look at what 
we look at what they believe and we understand it and we understand why they believe it, but then we come back with our own reasons of why we believe what we believe it. Yeah. It almost strengthens yeah. it. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. We're going to talk more about that too. Yes. I think it kind of goes with this, but it's also like um, expanding your own ideas after being challenged. Yes. So. And that's one of the reasons why th this class, as I said, is, 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 it is chronological. We will be doing history, but it is largely thematic. We're going to be dealing with controversial issues, things that, that literally people went over to blows or, or, or into war with. And we get the, the worst, the, the, uh, the, the only thing that's at risk here in this class is the grave. <coughs> I mean, people literally died and killed over this stuff. We're going to talk about this, and hopefully, you know, one of the things we'll, we'll come out with understanding and hopefully... Um, you know, even a, a more firm, and, um, not just understanding of the other side, but of ours and who we are. If we can show other people our faith <coughs> by the way we live differently than others, and then become friends with them and teach them about what we believe, yes. we are automatically connected into other countries because <coughs> they will go back to their countries and share with them what they know, which could set the world on fire. Thank you, Christine, for saying that because uh, one of the th we are going to discuss this further because we, we're living in a time where, where, where Christians and churches are increasingly having to think outside of the box as to how are we going to... I mean, Christianity is 2,000 years old now. It's got a history, which for many people is not even that great. If you were to ask most Native Americans to this very day, Christianity, thanks, been there, done that, no thanks. I mean, they don't associate Christianity with, with much that's good. Okay, so the question is, and, and, and we don't live in an era, you know, where like, you know, in, in, in the Middle Ages where, where a Charlemagne converted the Anglo-Saxons at the point of the sword. Okay, or the conquistadores just came over here and just conquered everybody, you know, they came with cross and sword. Okay, so, um, and if Protestantism, which is still the favorite religion of the land, but is declining in power and influence, certainly in numbers, statistically, okay, if we're not living in an era where we can coerce people about our faith, which Christianity has long done, okay, how are we going to do what it is we believe? I mean, how are you know how do we win people over? And and, and a lot of people talk about the, the need to close the gap between what we say or what we believe or claim and what we do. What we do becomes increasingly more important because what we believe, lots of people know that now, and there's a million ways to believe. I mean, think about it. I, often, I ask students sometimes, just half jokingly, so this is kind of tongue in cheek, but I ask, you know, what's more incredible and fantastic, the gospel or the Lord of the Rings? <coughs> right? I mean, Mormonism, where the God lives on Kolob with a million wives, okay, on a planet, you know? You, you don't know that. You're looking at me with funny looks. We're going to talk about Mormonism later, but, but you know. You know, and all of us, when we, if you're a Mormon, you know, if you, you achieve the highest thing that a Mormon can achieve, you'll have your own planet and your own harem. Okay? So when you look at, the, if someone had said, when you look at some of the other beliefs, you just go, that's weird. Okay? Well, what's weird? You know, if you look at, if you look at the, uh, the gospel that we preach, or you compare it to the Lord of the Rings, they're both fantastic. It's not strange to us, because you grow up with it. And a guy walking on water and resurrections and, you know, having a few loaves and a few fish and feeding 5,000 people, um, that's not strange to you anymore. But from someone else's perspective, that's just as weird as, as orcs and sorcerers and, and, uh, and you know, dragons and so on. We forget that it's not weird to us, but it's weird to other people. So what we believe, <coughs> you know, while important for many people... That's not, that's not it, you know, you know they, they're going to need to see what we do, how we live. That, and, and, and one of the things that we'll see is increasingly this is going to be a, a really important issue. It isn't just what you say or you, what you claim, particularly if there's a massive gap between what you believe and what you do and how you treat people. I mean, that's why Native, among Native Americans, just, they don't like Christianity. They're the same, well, these, you're preaching this gospel to us, but you're stealing our land and killing us. So there's a difference between what we believe and what we do. That's an increasingly important issue. It's, it's, it is currently in the dialogue among, for example, third world Christian and uh, missionary theologians and others. We're discussing you know, the, the need, not just for orthodoxy, right belief, but orthopraxy, right action. It's the right action that makes our belief believable. Does that, does that make sense?
From the responses of students from the interaction level of the classroom, I think you'll see that most students found it interesting. Uh, for one, it dealt with, with, I try to ask questions that I'm, I know will be interesting to students. And I kind of, I believe kind of, and I say this kind of half tongue, uh, tongue in cheek, that I believe students would rather be angry than bored. So what I mean by that is, is I, I, I ask questions I know that they will talk about if for no other reason that they disagree, <laughs> that they're very, that they have a very emotional opinion attached to it. Um, so I, I asked them questions. You know, many of them are loaded questions, and um, and and discussion. Of, you could probably see from the footage was was uh, was very interactive, and the entire class went that way. It was quite interactive. But I designed this particular class to be that way. I think the first barrier is is that you have professors who themselves are not culturally. If I can say this without, I don't mean to be offensive, but they're not culturally competent. In other words, you can, there's a difference between talking about, the, for example, I teach a course called Minorities in America. And I was essentially asked to teach that class because the, the white professors who had taught it before, while they were sincere, they felt like they didn't have the experience as a minority to teach the class. They had no credibility and that they were teaching at the level of, of knowledge, of book knowledge and history. But they couldn't actually, they couldn't tell stories. Um, they couldn't really they couldn't really talk at the level of, of genuine engagement and experience um, so that's one thing you know if uh, professors can be very sincere but if they don't actually have an experience if they haven't really engaged you know Tim Essenberg who, who literally moved this family they live in a community different from the one in which they grew up so that's one thing um, Another thing is, is I think that sometimes as professors, we, we want to have the right answers. So we want to make sure that students come out of there and, and uh, we kind of help solve their problems. And, and the fact of the matter is, is these, a lot of these issues are messy and, um, and they're going to remain messy. So I don't, I don't pretend to have the answers to these really difficult questions that we ask. My goal is to figure out how to ask a good question and let the students struggle with it. Another thing is, is, is the, uh, it remains that for many students, it remains at the level of of uh, just data and they're supposed to know this stuff and this is that person's experience and then sooner, sooner or later they're gonna have to regurgitate this information on the exam that kind of information is not it's, that kind of pedagogy is not conducive um, so you know sometimes th there's a need for some some professors don't maybe maybe they don't know enough about experiential learning creating scenarios and activities that get us out of the book, that get us out of the theory or whatever the case might be and into something that helps students say, something that they would never have seen before. All of a sudden they see it because they, they, they went through an experience or they, they went and, and, uh, and you literally went into the Twin Cities and met different people or had some kind of other engagement outside of the book, outside of theory. So that's, that's one thing, you know, so, you know, a lot of the, the teachers themselves, I, the reason I know this is because having engaged with some of this among professors, I have been asked by many professors, I don't know how to do this. There was nothing in my degree and in all my training that prepared me to do this. So I teach computer science and math or this and any other. Nothing in all of my experience teaches me how to engage in, culturally, in a culturally responsive education. So they either haven't had it and, uh, or they feel uncomfortable with it. Uh, we try to come up with two easy answers. We're, we're unwilling to realize that this is messy and that it needs to stay messy. One thing is I, I think they have to, um, if, you, if you're willing to admit, maybe you don't know much about it, um, and willing to, to do the work, because that's one of the problems is, is that creating culturally responsive classrooms takes a lot of work and if you're not used to doing that if you're from a field where you didn't have the training um, you know you have to be willing to say I have a lot to learn and, and, to, and, to, and, to, and to do the stuff that needs to take that. One of the things you can do is, is certainly network with those who you feel are already doing it well. I learned a lot from Karen McKinney for example on, on um, interactive you know activity kinds of learning experiential learning because she has so many great uh, kinds of activities uh, and also I learned a lot from her, uh, you know, how to process that activity afterwards, which is obviously very important. So to connect with people, not, not just there's tons of literature out there, there's good stuff online, but to actually connect with, uh, with other professors that are already doing this, maybe sit on their classrooms, um, that would be one thing I would really recommend. That has always been helpful. I, I learned a lot because I worked with Karen uh, two summers with the Urban Leadership Academy, and I got to see how she does things, and she has a gigantic bag, 
full of materials to play different kinds of games depending on, on, the, on the theme or the issue you're trying to get the students to learn. And the, the other thing is just to, to feel free to think outside of the box and make mistakes. One of the things I've really learned is how to create, is, is, is how to ask good questions, stimulating questions, uh, Socratic scenarios that get people thinking um, from the perspective of someone else's view or someone else's culture that they might not have seen before. Uh, particularly hot button issues that they may have already walked into the class with their opinion already formulated and um, and it's going to take something else to get them to see the, the world from that other person's perspective and you need to do that especially if you're going to be in education or in medicine or some other kind of service oriented field that you're going to the target group is a people that you really know almost nothing about so you're going to have to do something in order uh, just for communication alone uh, let alone understanding who these people are, what they really need, how you can best serve them. Um, and I think if you if you know people at, here at Bethel, for example, that are already doing a good job at that, I know there's people in education, nursing department, and other fields, you know, that uh, people are already doing it and doing it very well. They're known for it. Then, you you know, a good thing to do would be to connect with them, get ideas from them. I, I, email, I email people and talk to them all the time and said, hey, you know, w what do you do for this? Another thing is I think... Um, is, is trying to overcome a feeling of threat. Uh, I was just thinking about this. Uh, um, I, I remember when Paulo Ferreira talks about education as, uh, as socializing people into the values of the dominant culture. And Sometimes we think that if we change something that, that it's an actual threat to us, um, either to the meta narrative we're used to or to our, we take it personally to the way that we conduct stuff. Um, so that's one thing, being willing to take the risk. Um, you know, you can you can engage in in various forms of education, whatever it needs, so that you can play catch up. Um, the other thing is is be, be, beyond the books, beyond the the theory, is you you have to you know create the relationships um, with the target group. Um, so if you're if you're um, working with young people, working with students, and the target group that they're going to be working with is a Latino community then it's, it, to me it goes without saying that the professor needs to have some kind of connection with that community himself or herself um, and need to provide the students some kind of uh, opportunity to engage in that, in that connection so that you're not just, you're, you're not just getting it out of books and, and that's all well and good and there's, there's stories, there's ways to, to, uh, to, um, to help people understand you know, the different culture but ultimately I think there's, there's no substitute for actual contact. One of the other things I had, I, I think I was thinking about was um, that that we need to move beyond just the kind of the multicultural model, um, so that people are again actually uh, not you're not just learning you know uh, and gaining awareness of different cultures of their needs so that you can better s serve them um, and communicate with them, but um, but it has to take place within a context of actual. Um, if I can, the, the word I'm missing a word is co cohabitation, where people are actually engaged in friendship with one another. Uh, you, you're working together. You're actually getting to know one another, so that you, you you're not knowing them simply by what you've heard or what you've read, or even you know the, probably the worst of all is just stereotypes. It begins, you know, with with the professors, and professors first of all have to model it. We can't ask students to become culturally proficient at, at what we're not culturally proficient at ourselves. Um, that's a big thing because students immediately pick up on it. And so it gets to be kind of do as I say but not as I do. Uh, also because there are students, the other thing to do is, is, is to uh, take advantage of the students who do have experiences in the classroom. On the one hand, you want to protect them because you don't want to always make them the star and the one and, and, uh, or the people who has all, all, all the attention and who um, is responsible to speak on behalf of their people, but on the other hand, they do have experiences, and if they, you can tell if they want to speak, if they want to share, then you know that's a good thing to let them do that. Um, so part of it is is is, cre is the classroom experiences. So I think students, as they avail themselves of the classroom experiences, take classes in the Gen Ed curriculum, um, seek them out. I, I know, depending on your major, that you can graduate from Bethel not having really had much experience and not, not, not coming up very culturally proficient. It's not necessarily any fault of your own, oftentimes it just depends on your major. 
Um, so that means then that you that you should try to take advantage if you can as a student. Um, um, what courses in the gen ed curriculum are doing this? Um, what courses that might, might not be in the gen ed curriculum, but you can take them as electives that are doing this? So those kinds of things that you can do. Um, take, a, take, a, take your U classes, you know, your cultural diversity kinds of courses. Um, if there's a Z tag that's available that, uh, that allows you to have a much more immersed experience, um, do something overseas by all means. Uh, there's, there's lots of classes being offered during interim, and there's like a you know, semesters abroad so you know get out there as much as you can and the other thing is I would recommend is when you do that when you get in those immersed experiences um, try to connect with somebody a professor or somebody that will help you to make the most of that experience so that you're not just going there um, and observing and um, you know, texting every two seconds or doing what it is you normally do you're just in Africa doing it um, but that you're, you're, you, you are consciously there. You're there to really try to learn from the people, from the history, um, whatever it is, whatever it is you've gone there to do, to really take advantage of it um, so that you're not thinking, boy, I really, I really missed hamburgers or I really miss a good pizza. Um, so something has to happen in order to prepare the students so that they are geared up to take to, to have a deep experience there because I know of many students who go to foreign places and they're they're in a different cultural uh, milieu other than their own but they don't really come out with a lot so something has to prepare them to to get as much of the, uh, uh, much out of it while they're there and then there has to be processing you know um, when they when you know all through the pro all through the experience and then when they come back so that's what I would recommend to students, you know, take advantage of what does exist, especially if you're in a major that normally wouldn't allow you to have much in the way of, 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 of culturally, cultural, you know, experiences other than your own. I know I've talked to several students who coming to Bethel is the most diverse place they've ever been to. And, um, and so, you know, I, I encourage them, you know, to, 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 to seek out, you know, uh, people from different churches, um, from different cultural or racial backgrounds. Um, you know, those, those are things that we can do, and, and uh, for some folks, Bethel might be the safest place that they'll have to do that transition, uh, to take advantage of those things. Go to a church that's different from, you know, that, go to a multicultural church, you know, go to, you know, where places, you know, where people are worshiping God, they love the Lord, but, you know, there's people from different backgrounds there, and that, that'd be pretty, a pretty, fairly easy thing to do. Um, I don't know. Other things is more trivial. Try different foods. You know, just try, just try different worlds. You know, I think you'll find it exciting. Learn a language. It's another thing. I, Bethel now has a language requirement. Uh, language is uh, arguably the, the 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 most important carrier of culture. So if you learn a language, you're learning something about another culture, their history, and so on. Uh, I, I I tell educate students that are getting into education, or or other kinds of service fields like nursing learn another language. Not only will it help you when job times, job search time comes, but you will literally be able to communicate in, in two worlds, the, the one that you're used to, the English-speaking world you're used to, and a Spanish or a French or whatever world that you, you didn't know before. And um, you will be a more attractive candidate when job time comes, but you'll find you know, so much more because things get lost in translation. Oftentimes people see another culture only through what they've heard or through stereotypes, but when you, when you learn a language, you know, um, you, you are able to enter inside a culture in a way that you can't do otherwise. So those are some of the things I'd recommend.